One of the questions I was asked was, what are the journal entries, just what are they for arrow? So let's talk about what they are at the beginning, what are they at the middle, and what are they at the end? Because if we think of us, like if we think of ourselves like storytellers uh, telling the story of the business, we can think about it in terms of beginning, middle, and end. So at the beginning, we need to capture what are the future costs that we need to record and add to our, our asset. So, you know, this asset, part of its acquisition is the fact that we have to have some costs to either restore the land back to its natural use. Maybe we need to um, tidy it up and sell it. We're under some legal or constructive obligation to get it back. So first we can we calculate the present value and we add this to the asset. We used to call it the asset retirement costs. We used to call it the ARC. Um, here we can actually just add it right to the asset itself. So asset itself, so whether that's oil tanker or whatnot. And then we would put it to our uh, liability. So our asset retirement obligation, or if it was under IFRS, we call it our decommissioning provision. Okay, so and we would do that for the present value of the future costs, and we would do so at the market interest rate. So what is the rate in which reflects the current economic reality of um, how much money costs uh, for a risk adjusted rate? Meaning if I'm in a riskier company, I would need to have a higher rate to reflect the fact that it is riskier. So at market risk adjusted rate. Okay, so the whole goal here is we're making this smaller. So just say our future costs were, uh, for example, I'm just gonna make up some numbers here. Say the uh, future costs were 100,000 and we were using a rate of, uh, market risk adjusted rate of 8%. And this is going to be occurring in 10 years because we accountants love our numbers. Uh, we have zero payments going out the door now. Then we would have present value of our $50,000. So I'll just put that here. I'm gonna call it 51,000 because I am a rebel who rounds. And here we go. Alrighty. So then in the middle of the story, I need to record my finance expense or if I'm under ASPE, that would be, so I'm just gonna flip this around arrow. So that would be accretion expense for ASPE or my finance expense if I was under IFRS. And this is going to be my present value. So my 51,000 times by market rate, assuming nothing changed in the market. So I would record it at 4K, like 4.1K. 4.1K. Perfect, debit and my credit. Because what's gonna happen here is this is going to be my arrow, my decommissioning obligation, and we decommissioning provision. We can see this thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's because at the end of 10 years, this thing, which started at 51K, is gonna go up to 100K. So that's how we get there, by expensing little bits by little bits every year. So we're actually, we're saying that when you bought this thing, 51,000 of the future costs to retirement that's gonna be capitalized, that's going to your balance sheet, that's going to your asset. And then over the next 10 years, little bits, little bits, little bits are gonna to go to the income statement right away to reflect the fact of the time value of money. Okay, so then at the end, so we're gonna do this every year until the end, until 10 years. And at the end, we are going to have to get rid of our ARO, our decommissioning provision. And then our credit is to whatever we use to uh, to tidy up the land. So maybe it goes to a credit to salaries payable. Um, perhaps we're using inventory. Um, perhaps we are, you know, we're just, maybe we're paying cash for somebody to, you know, take some stuff off the land. We are going to get it done. So what you'll see is at the beginning of the story, this got capitalized to the asset. And then what happens to assets? Well, if they are depreciable, they get depreciated, and if they're not depreciable, they'll still be there, and they're sub they're um, subjected to annual uh, impairment tests as well. Okay, and then this goes to our income statement, and this adds to this, and then it makes our liability bigger and bigger and bigger. Times that every year, our carrying value of our liability, 
by our market rate of our interest to get our accretion or our financing expense. Then by the end of the story, <laughs> our present value, our premier carrying value at that time is equal to our future value. Then we get to reverse it. We get to reverse it. And we no longer have um, the asset if it's fully depreciated or it's at full value or impaired value if it's a non-depreciable asset. And this is all out the door. So we no longer have um, a decommissioning provision if we've in fact you know, paid the fees to settle it as we expected 10 years ago when we got this asset to begin with. So I hope that was helpful. Let me know if it wasn't. Email me. I mean, we can have a part two uh, to this. Anything else that isn't clear. A few other questions, uh, just real quick, relating to the arrows is uh, what is the standard for coming up with the number for remediation? So that would be just like our CPA way example, it would be either internal engineers, external engineers, environmental consultants, uh, perhaps some lawyers, uh, some specialists, um, but anything. So financial statements are signed off by management. So management says, hey, to the best of my ability, these things represent the financial reality of this company. So all of the estimates, all of the inputs there, are really management's responsibility. And we need to rely on management. So I love, um, we have a number of auditors uh, and as well as students going through the audit program right now. So the audit class, asking these questions, where do they come from? And a theme that tends to come up in intermediate financial accounting too is, well, what, can they just lie? Absolutely. Um, but not really, because they'll get audited. And as CPAs, uh, we, we can lose our designation. Uh, and we put way too much time, money, intent, and our, our integrity is wrapped up in our letters. So perhaps we could, but we wouldn't, or else we wouldn't be here. So when you, we're provided numbers, absolutely. Use your critical judgment, your skeptical mind, and ask, where did those come from? Um, I was also asked, what is um, the thought process as far as the arrow based on the asset value? So this comes into play. Again, this is the first and only time that we are actually touching the underlying asset. So we're capitalizing it. It's just like any other, it's like shipping costs, right? If we had to pay shipping costs to acquire an asset, we could have capitalized those, right? This. This is a cost to doing business. And if, even though it's a cost that it happens in 10 years, we need to reflect the economic reality that it happened today. It happened upon acquisition and we need to reflect it in today's dollars. Now, understand that this goes to the balance sheet and gets capitalized and then it is subject to impairment analysis. So if the shipping fees and the actual fees and the asset retirement costs all go to the asset and then all of a sudden the assets carrying amount is below uh, the amount that is being used to run the impairment test, then it's impaired and it goes straight to the income statement. So just something to keep in mind. The other question I had related to the ARO is what if the amounts used to make the estimate this year uh, substantially change next year? And I would say kudos to you, the question came up in a couple different ways or methods according to chapter 12, but essentially the major thing was what if the numbers we use, the estimates that we use change? And I would say kudos to you, and you will see that in chapter 21, but essentially to, uh, to spoil that, we account for it prospectively. So we account for it in the current financial statements and going forward, we do not go back and change past financial statements for the change of an estimate.